الله أكبر الله أكبر Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Islamic Center at New York University podcast coming to you straight from the heart of New York City. We're building an amazing Muslim community here at ICNYU where everyone is welcomed and respected no matter where you're from or where you're at. This is the place to be. So open your ears and your heart and come along with us on another life-changing journey. Bismillah. Bismillah. Bismillah walhamdulillah. والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. So we've been looking at a text called the Book of Assistance uh, by Imam Al Haddad, Rahmallah. If people want to pull it up, you can just Google the Book of Assistance PDF. Um, it'll come up on a bunch of different sites. Uh, and we're on the ninth chapter that is on reflection. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with the text itself. It's a book on spirituality and essentially what this text does is it presents in very easily digestible chapters anywhere from a page to a handful of pages a variety of topics within our spiritual tradition that create a road map for the individual to grow through practice through theory through understanding of theology etc as a mechanism of inward growth. And in our tradition, there's not a separation between what is religious, spiritual, and ethical. These things all have an overlap with one another. Right? So we're moving away from more contemporary parlance that at times allows for somebody to say, I'm spiritual but not religious. And it's not to knock anybody. But to be Muslim necessitates you having to be both religious and spiritual if we were to see those as kind of separate terms but recognizing that there's an essential synergy between these two terms along with an ethical base, a value base that doesn't render itself through a moral relativism but a sense of what is moral and what is unambiguously good through the prism of a divine imperative. Where and how this relates is more so through perspective, right? If we were to try to give a definition to spirituality from within an Islamic framework, you could give it a baseline definition of the capacity to ascertain meaning from one's environment or surroundings. You think about day to day, just how often individuals are moving in a mode of default settings with not so much consciousness or awareness or mindfulness, but even at the other end of the spectrum, overt mindlessness. That there's not necessarily time to stop and reflect or contemplate. Or when I look at somebody, I only understand and assess them through a baseline set of stereotypes. What is the most simplistic and at times reductive interpretations because I'm looking at you through who I perceive you to be rather than really gaining a deep connection. So I can't see you bigger than your race or your class or how I perceive your religiosity. I can't understand you in a way that sees you as a whole person. And I limit my perspective through my perceptions of the accent you have or the accent you don't have. I look at your cultural heritage, your country of origin, through a prism of intellectual laziness. And Ihsan, which quite often gets translated as Islamic spirituality, is essentially rooted in this, right? It's a, an ability to perceive, but a perception that is attached to how we see things. And that sight can get understood not through what is most apparently understood of a vision of the eyes but a vision of the heart that takes in everything that our organs of sensory perception consume what we're hearing what we're tasting what we're feeling and touching what we even think about through a primary organ of cognition the heart and it then casts for us an ability to perceive differently than how others might perceive certain things. And all of what this text creates is an opportunity for an individual to enhance that capacity of sight, to be able to perceive 
not just at what is most simplistic, but to perceive with a certain air of depth, with a certain air of beauty. That's why it's called Ihsan. It's got the etymological root of Hasana, which is rooted in beauty. You want to see it for what it actually is, not what you might perceive it to be. Does that make sense? And so why this is something that's important to understand? There's like millions of self-help books that are written. What's interesting, that you can walk into any library, any bookstore, and amongst the categories of sections that you find, you'll find a very large section that's on personal development, self-development, self-help. There's no book section that's ever about how do I help others, or how do I engage with others. But a lot of these texts have overlap in terms of the content, because there's millions of people who will buy these things, but there's only handfuls of people that actually act upon what the text is saying. And for a book like this to be something that renders transformative capacity, just like any book that we engage, the Quran, the multiple texts of Hadith that we have access to, so much that we're given, you want to be able to distinguish yourself from others who read a book by being able to draw meaning from the book and then acting upon what you have the capacity to act upon. And this is a deep source of contentment from within an Islamic traditional standpoint that knowledge in and of itself becomes a source of contentment for the heart. You want to have answers to questions. You want to be able to know why is all of this here? What's the point of all of this? Your heart is yearning for that understanding and the Depth of that contentment comes from taking what you know and acting on what you know and keeping those two things close to each other. Not keeping them far away from each other, but keeping them close. And so as we go through this, you have to determine for yourself, how am I going to practice on these exercises that are meant to purposely enhance at this stage of my life a deeper connection to self and through that deeper connection to self, a deeper connection to the divine. This is what a text like this offers, an opportunity to increase in it. So just to give you all also, for those who it might be your first time, we're going to do the dars until around Maghrib time. Uh, then we'll have iftar after, whether you're fasting or not, stick around um, to have a meal with us after Maghrib. Um, we've been having pizza the last couple of weeks here, but there's a sister and her mother who are cooking um, food for all of us tonight. Uh, if you were here in Ramadan, um, when iftars were much larger at the IC, if people remember, Ramadan was not so far away, but you know, it might feel like a distance. On the weekends, they were the two that would sometimes cook um, in addition to what we were serving. Uh, and I know they put in a lot of hard work into it. So if you can stick around um, just to eat, even if you weren't fasting, we'd appreciate it. It's also just a way for us to continue to build community and get to know one another. Um, but we'll break for Maghrib. Uh, there's a restroom here if people are not familiar with the space. You can also um, go down to the basement level, which is the SC level in the elevator. And there's a handful of bathrooms there as well if people um, need to use a restroom uh, at any time. Um, and a lot of how we do this is a little bit more interactive and discussion-based. Um, just so we're kind of learning from each other and taking from one another as best as we can. So we're on chapter 9, which is on reflection, fiqh. Uh, what Imam al-Haddad does, he starts the text with a chapter on yaqeen, certitude. Certitude being like deep faith, right? The way that everyone has reasonable faith, essentially, whether they're a practitioner of a religion or not. Um, but being able to draw from that sense of reasonable faith, what does it mean to have yaqeen? So the way that you all came in here and you assumed that the lights would turn on, right? You go into your homes and you open a faucet. Your assumption is that there's going to be water that comes out of the faucet. You have a belief that it's going to essentially work in that way, right? Yaqeen is having a certitude in Allah and the elements of our theology Believing in that the way you would believe that the lights are going to turn on when you turn the switch Believing in all of like Allah's promises everything that kind of stems from that from certitude He goes into a chapter on intention Nia. These are ones we've already done before 
right? The idea of knowing why you're going to do what you do before you, you do it. Setting also a metric of assessment that as you journey, you're able to look back to what was the impetus and do I need to realign it now to new intention or do I recognize that I might have moved in a way that I wasn't intending to and I got to look back to backtrack to say, how do I get back to what my objective or my goal was? But to bring that kind of awareness and consciousness. The third chapter is on vigilance, muraqaba. You're essentially looking over your heart so your heart can look over you. You engage in a place where the heart is literally like a soldier standing guard at a castle or citadel. The heart becomes now vigilant as a protector as you go on this journey. These first three chapters are just on actions of the heart. Then in the fourth chapter, he introduces the topic on the inner self and the outer self. Right? So there's an Islamic framework to understanding the self. You're not just your physical body, the jasad, the badan, but you are in addition to that, the nafs, the lower self that exists in multiple states. You have a ruh, a soul. You have irada, sheer will and determination. You have the aql, the intellectual capacity. You have the qalb that has multiple layers to it. And then you also have within yourself all of your memories, your experiences, your emotions, your feelings. There's so much to you that is not just what exists outwardly or externally. He then talks in chapter 5 on regular devotions, the awrad, which the chapter we're in now is a subsection of that. And the chapter on awrad goes into the idea that essentially self-management and time management are rooted in an intrinsic linked relationship because time management is essentially management of the self right and there's a principle here of baraka baraka being the ability to do more with less that's how blessing can be understood in our tradition that you can increase baraka the ability to do more with less by bringing structure and routine into your day and in that chapter he talks about the importance of doing things that we might understand to be mundane but necessitate regularity sleeping, eating, socializing, friendships, and building into it then opportunity for Quranic recitations, uh, adhkar, prayers, etc. And the next few chapters are subsets. So chapter 6 is on recitation of the Quran. He says you have to have a daily wird, a daily practice. So every day you got to read a little bit of Quran. In chapter 7, the acquisition of knowledge that you want to have regularity. He doesn't put a time constraint on it, but an opportunity to engage in regular acquisition of a knowledge base that you want to continue to learn and grow more. In chapter eight, he talks about remembrance, doing regular adhkar as a part of the weird also. So these are all subtopics to the weird itself. And now we're on chapter nine on reflection, fiqh that having opportunity for deep contemplation, finding stillness where you're just kind of reflecting upon various things. So I'd like for you to do, just because there's more people in the room right now, if you haven't, pull up the text on the Book of Assistance uh, PDF. And rather than starting at chapter nine, if you go to the table of contents and just look at these first nine topics as we delve into the ninth chapter, you're gonna see in the table of contents just the topics, right? You can pull it up on your phone, uh, the book of assistance, PDF, it'll come up. I want you to turn to the persons next to you. What is the link between all of these topics? Not like all nine in a row, but how can you find connections between the various subheadings? How does certitude relate to intention? Or how does intention relate to this conversation on reflection? Right? Because quite often the way we learn religion becomes rotely memorized and regurgitated. Ihsan is not something you can memorize. It's an experiential knowledge. And you're going to have to tap into a critical thinking capacity that quite often gets muted in the way we learn religion. Whether you went to a traditional learning program, whether you went to Sunday schools, whether you converted to Islam, whether you were born into a Muslim family, quite often it's front-facing. Somebody's telling you things in these very matter-of-fact and quite often black and white modes. There's not opportunity to engage in conversation. And the idea with our religion is not to have 
a high bar of entry because it's a religion that claims universality that anybody can be Muslim from any background and any walk of life for the last 14 centuries until the end of time. And so within that, having a little bit of information can create an opportunity for broader perspective. Like if you know Surah Al-Ikhlas, right? Imam Shafi, he says, if all you know of the Quran is Surah Al-Asr, Wal-Asri, Inna Linsana Lafi Khus, till the end of that chapter, if that's all you know of the Quran, then that's all you need to know, it's sufficient. But how? Right? The application of these ideas, these concepts, these teachings can't be understood compartmentalized or in a vacuum, but how they inform one another. Right? A lot of us, we pray, but in our religion, you don't just pray, you pray to God. You understand? And it's a distinction between a prayer of the body and a prayer of the heart. Right? Because a prayer that comes from the tongue, that's a prayer that has no mindfulness of Allah. A prayer that's from the heart, attached to the tongue, is one that has a mindfulness of Allah. So, recognizing in settings like this, we start to think out, how do these different things link to each other? Right? How does this part of the Qur'an give me an insight to this? How does what I eat inform how I sleep or how I pray? So we're not just spitting out words thinking that that's the goal. A parrot can say la ilaha illallah. A human has a different capacity to be able to understand. Do you see what I mean? So you pull up the table of contents, just turn to the persons next to you, any of them, not all nine in a row, but how can you see a link between these things, right? Imam al-Haddad starts with yakin, certitude, because he's giving us a destination point, right? So just so we are aware of this, because everybody is not starting in the same place, but a destination can be common, right? So how did these things help relate to that? Maybe it's an easier framework, but what are the connections that are there? If you could turn and talk to the people next to you, and then we'll come back and get more into the ninth chapter, inshallah. Go ahead. Okay, so what do we come up with so far? Any connections? Any thoughts that come up? What did you discuss? Yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. Um, yaqeen, certainty, uh, which is as the initial perspective of reality should be the certainty that Allah is high existent. And then through that, uh, our uh, intentions should be to whatever we do to gain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we went towards vigilance, where in which we should be aware. Uh, and careful that you know shaitan he only goes into the house that has treasures in it so inside of us there are treasures that he wants um, basically exactly yeah. any other thoughts yeah so what you want to do if you've missed any of the sessions you can find them online on a podcast um, they're all up there uh, but start to think even in relation to just anything that you're engaging with or things that were given to you as a younger person or at different stages of your life 
and not to see how they exist kind of separate but all together in terms of informing the various parts of just our engagement with Allah on a whole. Um, it makes religion a very different experience, you know, when I'm not just praying because I was told to pray, but I think about how does my prayer relate to all of these other kind of values and how does it relate to everything that goes into the course of our day-to-day -day routine, right? How does this verse of the Quran apply to this subject matter or these things that I'm kind of trying to figure out or wrestle with, do you know? Yeah, you can sit there. So if people want to go to um, the second page on the ninth chapter on reflection, uh, in Arabic is fiqh, fa kaf ra. Um, this is where we're at right now. We're going through each of these chapters pretty slow. Uh, and in the middle of the second page, which in the PDF that I'm looking at is page 32, um, we went through a few different forms of the reflection. And we're at the bottom of page 32 where he says, know that you must reflect on this worldly life, its numerous preoccupations, hazards, and the swiftness with which it perishes and upon the hereafter. Do people see where we are? Yeah, okay. Can someone read from there? Yeah, go ahead. Know that you must reflect on this worldly life, its numerous preoccupations, hazards, and the swiftness with which it perishes, and upon the hereafter and its felicity and permanence. Thus does God render the signs clear to you that you may reflect on this world and the hereafter. Don't you prefer the life of the world or the hereafter? The hereafter is better and more binding. The life of the world is but distraction and play, while the last devotes to meet the life of what they need. This kind of reflection results in losing all desire for the world and its wishing for the hereafter. Okay. So here now is another point of reflection that has a very regular presence within the Qur'an as a text and within the hadith across the board, especially in the onset of revelation. The Meccan society in which Islam is introduced, they have a theology, but that theology, the prevailing theology, doesn't have a belief in an afterlife. And you can see the connection now to how that theology renders practice devoid of any sense of accountability. Because if you fundamentally just exist where you are in the moment, and there's nothing else, why would you not just do whatever it is you feel like doing? So a Meccan society that very, very willfully kind of buries its daughters alive, right? They practice female infanticide. And you gotta think about how that's something that someone has the capacity to fundamentally do. Bury their own child alive in the earth. This is something that they did. Every element of racism, sexism that you could think of, classism, all very prevalent in various facets of the Meccan society. The mode through which decisions and choices were made and how a stratification of that society existed especially as it got closer towards the time that the Prophet ﷺ was now introducing Islam into the Meccan society. When you have this tribalistic society, there's no mayor of Mecca or governor of Mecca, right? Like there wasn't a mayor of the city of Mecca. The way that the society was constructed was that the various tribes had a relationship to each other and the strength of a tribe was based upon how the rights of its most underserved and underprivileged members were protected. And where and how there was a recognition that to a certain extent, some of the tribes were given a little bit more authority than others. So Quraysh were seen in a different capacity because they were the caretakers of the Kaaba. They had now a different relationship to the city of Mecca, but it gave them this distinction. But more or less, the way that you were honored was based off of how the rest of your clan and your tribe had your back. And if you were somebody who didn't have good lineage, you were somebody who your father wasn't well known, right? For example, you understand in the prophetic biography, the seerah, 
For those who are not familiar, the Sira literature refers to the essential kind of biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And within those texts, we have a lot that gives us insight from you know, the time he was born until the time he passes. Some start prior to from Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Abraham, you know, building up to how we land in Mecca. Nobody wanted to take the Prophet as a child into their home when the custom was you would send your child to live with the Bedouins and have foster parents nurse the child. Everybody who came to take a child for this purpose, they passed on the Prophet because his father Abdullah had already passed away. Their treatment of him was based off of literally the absence of his father. You understand? Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu an, who the Prophet says in the hadith, I've heard the footsteps of Bilal in Jannah. May Allah make us his companion in the next world. Bilal ibn Rabah in the early years of Revelation was from amongst the people who were deeply persecuted. They would put boulders on his chest, telling him to recant his belief in Allah. But they could do this to him because he was also a slave at that time. He had nobody looking after him or watching after him. There is companions like Julebib, who Julebib was described as somebody who was quite small. His face was described as being demim, it was disfigured. The men wouldn't allow for him to share their company. People mistreated him. He was literally like a small human being in physical stature. And his story is very beautiful, but if you look at his name, Julebib, it's the diminutive of the word Jalbab. Right? A jalbab is like the clothes that people would wear. And he's like a diminutive, meaning, you know how Hussein is the smaller version of Hassan, right? It's got like a term of endearment. The little Hassan is Hussein, right? Julebib is the diminutive of jalbab. The name in and of itself is kind of different. And then he's not Julebib, you know, the son of so and so or such and such. He's just Julebib. These weren't people that had then their rights honored so much because of these elements and also the absence of conviction, belief, that we didn't believe that there was anything coming after. So the mechanism of accountability, who are you gonna really be accountable to if you don't have this found belief that one day you're gonna stand in front of somebody who's gonna take you into account for your actions? What Imam al-Haddad is saying is, don't be like most people who think that just because they have it, they deserve it. Or that there's not consequences to the choices that you make. Right? The Qur'an constantly is not just refining theological belief in God, a very pure monotheism. Man kana yu'minu billahi wa bil yawmil akhir is a constant construct in the hadith. Whoever believes in Allah and in the last day. Whoever believes in Allah and in the last day. Again and again and again. You're hard pressed to find any page in the Quran that doesn't mention the hereafter. And when you take that Meccan society and you put it side by side to the society we live in, the secularism of this world coupled with supremacy is not rooted in a absence of God in the way that we understand godlessness to be, but what this secularism breeds is a sense within the person living in this society that there's nothing beyond this. Most of what's instilled within you is to just live in such a way that you take as much as you can from what's here right now only, and that's it. It's not built into your sensibility to say that the choices that you engage in, there is going to be a opportunity for you to be taken into account for it. That this world exists, but it exists proportionally to something else. And every system that's built in this world right now, in this country especially, gives a notion that it's built upon an idea that I can do whatever I want to as a person of privilege in the majority, and that everything is just about how I can take more from this world while I'm in it, right? 
and think about it through the prism of what our tradition believes in and hereafter. How could you fundamentally have healthcare policy the way that you do if you believe you're going to stand in front of God one day? How can you have gun control laws in the ways that you do? How could you exist in policies rooted in the anti-blackness that it is? How are there children still living in cages at our borders? How are there asylum seekers living in tents in the city? How is there anything that takes place and then you trickle it down to an individualized level? How is somebody comfortable in telling their child you cannot marry someone because of their skin color if they really believe in the hereafter? How could you get away with not giving in charity what you could? How do you get away with only greeting certain people but not greeting other people? What validates the condescension, the arrogance, the just abhorrence of individuals in a realm of hatefulness? May Allah protect us from it. And why is a belief in the hereafter so important? And then you bring it down to yourself individually. The notion that's there in terms of what comes next is a recognition that everything that happens in this world will be made sense of on that day of judgment. Every question of why. But fundamentally, the conviction, the belief in and of itself and the return to it helps in what ways to me and you. Why is Imam al-Haddad saying, for you today, reading this book, years after he wrote it, why do you need to be reflective on the reality of the hereafter? And a principle that's important to understand, our religion isn't rooted in irrational or rational modes of understanding only. It makes sense to me, it doesn't make sense to me. But it interjects the realm of supra-rational perspective that understands that I don't have to get it in order for it to be true. So whether the world believes in it or not, the Akhira is real, right? May Allah make us all people of Jannah. When you're making decisions and choices, Imam al-Haddad, he's very purposely saying, you got to reflect on the hereafter. Why? Why should you, in the year 2023, be regularly reflecting because in the first paragraph of this he said don't let 24 hours pass without some aspect of reflection taking place an hour a few hours doesn't have to be you sit down for a few hours but the sum total of your day being devoid of tapping into what makes you human the ability to think and reflect then you're just living like an animal and as he narrows it down, he says, make sure you're reflecting on the hereafter. Why? Why is this important to reflect upon regularly? If you could turn to the person next to you and talk this out, what's the importance of this? Why is this an important contemplative point? Reflecting upon the reality that is the hereafter? And then we'll come back and discuss. Go ahead. Okay. Shh. All right. So let's come back. Why, why is this a beneficial thing to reflect upon? Like where could you see yourself gaining from this kind of reflection? A reflection on the hereafter. What, what's the point of it? Why is Imam al-Haddad saying to reflect on this thing? What did you discuss? Who wants to start? Yeah. It makes you accountable for? And why is that a good thing? But so what? I'm not saying you're wrong, but why is that a good thing? Yeah, go ahead. But why? Why do we want accountability? Yeah. To change your behavior for what? Yeah. To prevent tyranny? Tyranny? What does that mean?
Why is that bad? Why is that bad? No, but why? Why? Like, what's, what's the point of it? If it prevents you from doing it, so what? Okay, but why? Why do you not want, why do you? This is a question is, why is it beneficial for you? Not we, for me. Why do I need to, you can't believe something because somebody else believes it. Do you understand? Right, like you can dress how somebody else dresses. You can dress, and you don't even know why you wear the clothes that you wear. You can eat how someone else eats. You can't believe something because somebody else believes it. Right, this is not an inherited religion in that sense. In this room right now, there's a lot of converts, mashallah, right? They buy into the theology, and then they have to deal with everything that comes along with it. There's some people who are thinking about becoming this religion, and then there's many of us who are born into it, and some of those who are born in, they came to it with more ownership at a later time in life, right? None of it is, you know, better or worse. It's different. We're all journeying together, but separately. But fundamentally, in all of it, the root of it is belief, right? There's conviction. Why do I need this belief? What is the gain for me to reflect on the reality of the hereafter? Why do I need it to be something that shapes my behavior or all of these things? What's the point of it? Yeah, right? You want to remember that something else is coming. So when I'm in this place of recognizing all of these things, one, the point of its reflection is to understand that it's real. I have to know that this is a real thing. Where do you go right now in the wakeful hours of your day, right? How many hours a day are you awake? How many hours a day are you awake? 16 hours a day. In the 16 hours a day that most of us are awake, how many of those hours are you exposed to things that serve as reminders purely of what is of this world versus reminders of how this world relates to the next world versus reminders of what is just the world beyond this one? Because you are a created being, but you are created for eternal existence. So, one, the reflection of this is about affirming and making concrete the actual conviction. And so much of your day is spent living in contradiction to that conviction. Do you understand? Right? Like in 16 hours that you're awake, how much of what you're exposed to tells you about anything other than what is egocentric and nafsi, self-serving, right? This is where people wrestle with things a lot. I had a student, I teach in our public policy school at NYU. We are at New York University still, for those who don't know. It's the building that my family and I live in. It's an NYU building. This is my son, Kareem. You want to wave to everybody? Yeah, great. <laughs> and I teach classes on leadership. And I had a student who is like a first-year philosophy student, no offense to any of you who are either studying philosophy or first year students, but he was talking the way like a kid who is a first year philosophy student would talk. We're talking in this class about service and servant based leadership and acts of kindness. And, these, and he said, but why should I want to help people? Right? And I was like, man, you know, because I'm a professor in the room. I'm not an administrator. So I have academic free, I can do whatever I want to, right? It's a really nice thing, you know? <laughs> so he's trying to like engage in his philosophy 101 kind of rhetoric. And then I said to him, but why would you not want to? And he didn't know how to answer it. And I was like, why would you want to be a person who can help someone and does not help them? Why would you want your stomach to be full, not only knowing someone else's is empty, but knowing the only way yours can be full is that someone else's has to be empty? 
Do you get what I mean? Conviction becomes the base of all of it. You work for certain things at the pace you work for because you believe in something. You might not want to admit it, but you might really believe and buy into the overt capitalistic desire that the country seeks to suffocate you with. You might believe that your goodness is only rooted in having a ring on your finger or owning a house or having children. And these are beautiful things to have. They can be fitna for some and ni'mah for others, right? May Allah give us only blessings in our lives. But if you believe you are only good or someone is only good if they have this, that's a problem. Do you see where it's a problem? If you believe in a reality where something exists forever, and the du du'as that you give to Allah are answered based off of His wisdom, not your wisdom, it's subservience to Him. And that whatever you're seeking that's not given to you here is given to you forever in the world beyond this one. But you don't ever think of forever, or you don't believe in forever, or understand yourself in relation to eternality. And then decisions are just made for the pursuit of immediate gratification or struggle and the falling and a mistake is also seen with overt hopelessness. The reality of a belief in the hereafter being a base conviction, foundational theology in Islam. Every Muslim has to believe in the Akhirah. Regardless of whether they're Sunni or Shia, regardless of within intra-legalistic theological distinctions. These are things that Muslims, you believe in the Akhirah. So reflection point number one is that I believe that it's a reality. Do you get what I'm saying? What gets in the way of making that reflection point easy? How many of the people do you associate with that you can say from their demonstrated behaviors, whether they're Muslim or not, right? I was with a woman in the UK in a small gathering of converts in Denmark, not in the UK. And there was like eight people in the room and one of them was this woman who came from a Punjabi background. She used to be Sikh and she converted to Islam. And they were telling me their stories of what brought them to Islam and all this and what it's like to be a convert in Denmark. May Allah make things easy for them. And she said, it took me seven years to become Muslim. And I said, why did it take you seven years to become Muslim? Like, what were you wrestling with? And she said, the Quran made sense right from my initial reading of it. That's why you got to read the Quran. And it's not coming from a place of judgment. It's coming from a place of love. I love you. I know some of you don't read the Quran. You can't benefit from its teachings if you don't take the text and read it. This person read it and she said, inside out, it made sense. And I said, then what was the challenge? And she said, it took me seven years to meet Muslims who actually practice what this book said who believed in its teachings, who demonstrated through their choices an embrace of its convictions. So it's not just I'm surrounded by a world that is not Muslim, but a lot of the Muslims that I engage. How do their decisions demonstrate a belief in the afterlife, a belief that there's something that comes after this world? Do you get what I mean? What else did we discuss? Like, why is this of a benefit? What is its relevance to you? Why do you need it? Me, make I statements. Don't make we statements. If you make a we statement, you're just playing a game with your heart. On something like this, you have to confront whether you actually acknowledge this is a reality and it's something that then informs how your heart perceives this world and what it's meant to offer to you. What else are benefits to this after we can say that yes, this is a reality? and see how that changes the prism of everything that you say, 
that it informs behavior, it creates accountability. You take it to its most logical conclusion in the reflective part and then come to me, it's something that shapes me and how I engage the world. What are other things that a understanding of the hereafter and a belief in it can do? Any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, and this is what Imam al-Haddad says. You reflect on the hereafter, you reflect on its felicity and its permanence. There's no busyness in Jannah. Can you imagine what that would feel like? Nobody's getting angry at you in Jannah. There's no fighting, there's no racism, there's no abuse, there's no oppression. It is a place that is the epitome of purity. May Allah make us people of Jannah. Can you imagine where there's just stillness, peace, calm? And that's just the default, always. Everybody is treated well, including you. You also treat everyone well, which is a hard thing that we wrestle with sometimes. And the permanence in relation to the felicity is important to understand because it's not momentary. It's not a novel experience. I was so excited the day I got my college acceptance. I was so happy the day of my wedding. It was so great the day my child was born. It was amazing the first time somebody told me that they loved me. That accomplishment, that achievement, that success, that feeling that you feel when everything just feels good, that's what Jannah feels like forever. It's not momentary, it's forever. And he says, Rahimullah, juxtapose that reflection to the realities of this worldly life, its preoccupations, its hazards, the way that it will perish. It's temporary. Do you get what I mean? So turn to the person next to you and now just think about these two things in relation. The realities of that hereafter. If you really believe it and buy into it or not. The way that the Quran identifies it. Even these few verses in translation that come after describing it or the things that we have said about it or the things that you can imagine and fathom in relation to this worldly life, think about that in the ways that Imam al-Haddad. So maybe before we compare, let's think about dunya now, in the ways that he is saying, reflect on this worldly life, its numerous preoccupations, hazards, and the swiftness with which it perishes. Just think about this world in relation to those three things. If you discuss with the persons next to you, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Go ahead. Okay, so what are some of the things that came up in this reflection on this worldly life, its preoccupations, hazards, its temporary nature? What did you discuss? Yeah, go ahead.
Yeah, amazing. Other thoughts? What did you discuss? Yeah, go ahead. Kareem. Yeah, we discussed a little bit about how we can understand while we're here in the dunya, the idea or the experience of something being forever. Um, we discussed how, from my perspective, it, 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 it seems almost as though law gives us moments in this world, either through intense beauty and pleasure or perhaps through pain and grief, where we understand perhaps just for a moment what it means for something to be forever. And then we're cast back into the world where everything has the illusion of temporariness, right? And we have to try and remember what it was that we were given in that fest, in that, in that opening of suddenly knowing what it is for something to be forever. Amazing. Um, other thoughts? So let me ask you this. How do you know what you believe in? Yeah. Through your actions? Like, if you exemplify what you believe in, we know that you believe in So this is where I'm going to ask again, right? And you didn't do anything wrong. But I'm asking you literally. And when you respond, I want you to try as best as you can. We're all sisters and brothers, right? We love each other. If you don't, I love each of you, you know? <laughs> How do you know what you believe in? So I know that I believe in things through my actions, right? I want you to say the statement so you can be accountable to the statement. Don't say it if you don't actually have accountability to it. Do you get what I mean? Because me saying you is not in a way that I'm deflecting, do you know? I can tell you why I believe in what I believe in. You know what I'm saying? But I'm asking you, how do you know what you believe in? Yeah. Yeah, and the combination of these two things go hand in hand. One metric through which you can assess what your actual belief is or convictions can be through an analysis of your actions. Do you know? If you don't believe in something, it's different than saying, I don't know what I actually believe in. I've never thought about it. Right? And belief is not only, but definitely a an important belief in Islam is a belief in Allah and what are kind of foundational beliefs, angels, books, etc. How do you know that you believe in, in truth or integrity, right? How do you know you believe in love? How would you know you believe in the hereafter? Do you get what I'm saying? And it's an important thing in and of itself to also think about. If you've never thought about it, this is kind of the paradoxical nature of decision making. When you don't make a choice you've essentially chosen, and it's easy to say things from the tongue, but when you get down and you engage in self-reflection, and you really think, do I buy into this? is very different from what am I buying into in the first place? This is where Imam al-Haddad is saying, like, just think about what this world is. Think about its preoccupations. Like, what is it 
that takes your attentiveness? What is it that can hold your attention, that can cause you to run around for hours and hours and hours? Why? What do you believe in that you're putting yourself through this? Do you get, do you get what I mean? How do you know what you believe in? What's an answer? What do you think? How do you know what you believe in? I mean, you can't. I was just pointing generally. But yes, please. What was your name? I'm sorry. Kothev. Kothev? Yeah. Nice to meet you. I know what I believe in through, I guess, the sense of security that I feel. And I feel like Amazing, right? This is why Iman has the same root as Amana, like trust, you know? Like a mu'min is one that has Iman. You know, there's kind of this shared root. But it can also give you a difference between like what is Iman versus what is Taqwa, right? How does the consciousness, because the Hadith says, the Taqwa ha right? The Prophet points to his heart. This is like where Taqwa is. You just listen to your, your inside sometimes, and it's going to tell you, just as the hadith says, something like makes you have alarms go off, your heart is telling you something. Something gives you like a sense of just like balance and contentment. Or there's even awareness that comes up. It doesn't necessarily have to create ease, but consciousness can also make you aware of what is not normal, Right? You can get to a place where you can render belief through understanding the absence of what creates tranquility. So some of us exist in, you know, may Allah make it easy, in toxic environments, surrounded by negative people, people who are abusive. You get to a place, I work with a lot of survivors of abuse, may Allah grant them ease and make us the best of their supporters. You sometimes only know what is normal in relation to what is not normal by being outside of it to say, hold on, this isn't how everybody lives. Do you, do you see what I mean? And that wakefulness becomes important to be able to start to now think like, hey, what do I believe? Do I believe I'm important enough to be safe? Do I believe that my friend is important enough that I don't pretend like that I don't know the hell that their life is? Do you get what I'm saying? How do you know what your belief is? And this is where the base of it comes. Yeah, look at the choices that I make. Look at the decisions that I make. Look at what it is that comes as a metric of what my heart is actually attached to. How do I treat people? The etiquette. Do you get what I mean? You spend X amount of, of your day, your week, your month, your year, in pursuit of which one of these things? The preoccupations, the anxieties, the hazards, the things that are going to get left behind, or what it is that's going to exist forever? You, you see what I'm saying? Does it mean that Imam al-Haddad is saying you just abandon responsibility? No, but it adds a different parameter to responsibility, right? Somebody asked me, why do you run around the way that you run around? One, like, I love all of you, and I want to be able to do as best as I can, so that when you ask me to do things for you, I am able to do them to the fullest of my capacity. I love my kids. Our tradition teaches us the behaviors of a parent are going to influence the ways that the children then benefit, right? Sayyid ibn Musayyib, he would tell his kids, I do good deeds so that you will benefit. The children who gain the wealth in the story of Moses and Khidr, they have righteous parents, that Allah is protecting the children's wealth from the unruly townspeople. If you don't know the hadith, just go Google it, the story of Musa and Khidr, and you'll read about what it is, right? But fundamentally, 
I believe in Allah and I believe in an afterlife. That's not the Islam I grew up with. It doesn't mean it wasn't given to me in that way, but I didn't think about it in that way. And when you can take conviction to be the base, and even if all the decisions end up being the same externally, you still go to the same job. You still do all the same things. But what's coming from inside is different. It's not going to necessarily change so much outwardly. It might. It might change a lot, right? It's really hard to be a jerk and believe in the afterlife. It is. It's really hard. It's really hard to give in to just base temptation and not seek forgiveness. The goal is to not pretend like you're perfect, but the belief in something bigger helps you to understand there's always a way back to Allah. Do you get what I mean? So the notion is not to pursue perfection. That's a foolish endeavor. But there's opportunity to say that I believe with what is forever and with permanence in the state of felicity, but conviction becomes the base of all of it. So how do I know that I really believe in this thing? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense? You got to take a pause to reflect on it, right? And then you take the two and you juxtapose them. Why am I living for one and not the other, but more so shifting the paradigm to say, how does one relate to the other? Do you get what I mean? What's the difference between this world and the next world? What's like a primary distinction? What do you think? Great. So how do we then understand this in relation to what's next? It's greater. And where, though, does one inform the other? Like you're in the dunya right now, right? Right? Let's go back to that philosophy 101 kid, right? Am I really here? Am I not here? You're like, come on, man. I was, please. You're here, right? You're not in the next place yet. So what's the relation between here and what comes after here? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to say something? So if something is eternal, it means it exists always forever, right? And if something is temporary and it comes before something that is forever, then the temporary thing can't be an ends, right? Right? So if it's not an ends, then it has to be a means to something. Do you see what I mean? And when you are able to put them together, the goal isn't to hate this world, but Imam al-Haddad, what he says is this kind of reflection results in losing all desire for the world and in wishing for the hereafter. It's important to understand language because it's not that I abandon responsibility in the world. This isn't a deen that, yeah, our Prophet وسلم, was seeking solitude in a cave when he gets revelation, but then he leaves the cave and he comes back to the society and he helps to build it and transform it. And what does he give to people? Right? Imagine the last moments of the Prophet وسلم, when he's asking for assistance. He tells his wife, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Muru Abu Bakr fa yusalli bin nas that go find Abu Bakr and tell him to lead the people in prayer. This is all he's thinking about. Asal al-Nas, that have the people made their salah. And when they can see him from his house, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, describing his face like this shining moon, and he's looking upon them, he's looking at them in prayer. That's what gives him solace. That's what's going to get you through the world. The Prophet is willing to leave from the world because our theology is based off of the idea that the prophets distinct from the rest of humanity, they're asked by the angel, 
if they're ready to go or not. The rest of us, we're just taken. May Allah make the best of our deeds the last of our deeds. The Prophet is comfortable in leaving because he sees his people making salah. The preoccupations of the world, you know that you are preoccupied by it if you're not getting up for fajr. And there's a difference between trying and not trying. The preoccupations of the world, if they are keeping you from engaging in what is going to benefit in the sense of what exists forever, and you just got to deal with what the obstacles are. What are the blocks that get in the way? Do you get what I'm saying? Does this make sense? And then the desire, the base hawa of it. Who fundamentally cares? You know? My son asked me the other day. He really likes Mr. Beast. People know Mr. Beast on YouTube, right? Does anybody know who Mr. Beast is? Yeah, right? Mr. Be Come on, you're lying if you don't know, right? This guy's like famous YouTuber. His face is all over the place, right? And Kareem asked me the other day, he's seven years old. He said, Baba, like, who's the most famous person you've ever met before? And then that conversation slowly trickled into, like, Baba, do a lot of people know you? <laughs> None of it matters unless you fundamentally do something with what Allah has given to you. Do you understand? The goal is to not be known or to have wealth. There are people who lived on this earth who have more wealth than the wealthiest of people right now all combined. You don't even know their names. You don't think about them at all. There's people whose notoriety, their infamy, their fame, far exceeded anything that you can imagine. But this tradition says, hey man, what's better is that your name is announced to the people of Jannah. That the inhabitants of paradise, they know what your name is. How are you living in such a way that you recognize that as a reality? So then you're not in a place where, yeah, it gets sad if something doesn't work. Allah gave you all of your emotions in the first place. You can be in a state of grief when you lose a loved one. That makes sense. It would be weird if you did not have grief at the loss of a loved one. But you understand the proportionality of this world in relation to the next. And you start to think, why do I believe in what I believe in? Through the state of my actions, my decisions, my choices, my etiquette with the world around me. And then I let myself not get rocked by the world because I didn't have some foundational desire. Hawa, that's what desire is, hawa. Which is different from a goal, an aspiration, a success, tawfiq. You see? So you got to reflect on this. Imam al-Haddad is saying, rahimullah. And it's one of the things that most of this world teaches you to not reflect on. You have four adversaries in our spiritual tradition. The waswasa of shaitan. May Allah protect us from his whispers. You have the lower self, the nafs. You have hawa, based desire. And you have dunya, the materialistic world. If you juxtapose this to what you invoke Allah by every day, Rabbil Alameen, the Alam is also the world, right? The Lord of the world. You're not calling upon Him as the Rabb of the dunya, but you're calling upon Him as still the Lord of the world, but Alam is rooted in ilm. But you take a step in this world and it can be a step of knowing or a step of forgetfulness. And that knowing is being able to recognize that you came from a place and you're going to a place. So seek to go to the place that you are the rightful inheritor of. Do you see how all of this informs itself through a recognition of what's going on inside and not just what is outside? And how this won't work if you don't practice or engage in the exercise of reflection itself most people don't do it. You can't gain from something what can only be yielded by getting it done. 
I can't just will myself to lose weight. I got to do what I need to do to lose weight, right? I can't will myself to have the gains that come from doing acts of charity. You want the taqwa that comes from fasting, then you got to fast, right? Makes sense, right? So you want the benefit of being able to reflect on what the hereafter is and strengthening the conviction in it so that it can come in moments of difficulty and tribulation. It becomes a mechanism to seize the openings that come in your way. It informs behavior and actions. But fundamentally, it allows for you to just enjoy your time in this world in ways that create real contentment. So you're not sitting in an office other than if you're somebody who has no choice and you got to do what you do, right? There's a difference between some of us and the brothers who work in the street carts around the IC and they can only catch the last rakah of Juma. When you can understand the role that the belief in the hereafter has, you'd want to think, why do I let somebody else do all the volunteering work? Why am I not sitting in the first row before the Adhan is called? Not as a metric of self-deprecation, but if I really get it, what is there? Do you see what I mean? It puts into proportion, why am I spacing my day so much chasing after this as opposed to what's going to give me contentment both in this world and in the next? Does it make sense? Okay, let's continue. He then continues, can someone read from page 33, know that you should reflect on the imminence of death? Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> know that you should reflect on the imminence of death, the regret and remorse which occurs when it is too late. Say, the death that you flee will indeed meet you, and you will then be returned to the knower of the unseen and the seen, and he will inform you of that which you had been doing. Until when death comes to one of them, he says, my Lord, send, send me back that I, may be, that I may do good in that which I have left. No, it is but a word, he says. O you, who be, o you who believe, let not your wealth or your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah up to, but God, but Allah, will be reprieved a soul whose time has come. The benefit, the benefit of this kind of reflection is that hope becomes short, behavior bitter, and provision is gathered for the appointed day. Okay, so let's take a minute. If you can turn to the person next to you. This reflection is now on death, right? It's not meant to be a morbid reflection. But what are you taking away from this section of what Imam al-Haddad is saying here? Rahmullah. If you turn to the person next to you, and talk it out. What are we taking from this passage? And we'll come back and discuss. Go ahead. Okay. So what are some of the things you're taking away from this next reflection point where Imam al-Haddad says to reflect on death? What are some of the things you're taking away? Okay, yeah, be alert. It could happen at any time, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about like not delaying things and like, do something or like you want to try to do something with something, you should really just do it right away. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I think there's a bit more clarity about like the things that we do now in this short time, right? Paying it forward to like the, the year after, like the, the forever. And it's like, make sure you do the things. Why do you think he says to reflect on the hereafter before he says to reflect on death? Right? If you were here last week, we talked about this also, right? And this is an important thing to understand. When you go through the beginning of this, like he's first telling you to reflect on who Allah is and all of Allah's divine names, right? That's got to be the first thing. There's a kind of order to this reflection that gets us to this place, you know? The first thing you want to reflect upon is not necessarily like hell. Do you know what I mean? Right? If anything, he's telling you to reflect on that at the very end. 
you know? Did you go through this entire process first to get to here? So why reflect on the hereafter before reflecting on death? Yeah. So when we were reflecting on the first three chapters in the table of contents, the first was um, certainty, then your intention, then vigilance. This somehow has this a similar pattern where it says, like, your intention is linked to the after life. So when you intend to do better here, then that reflects, like, that is a way, a means for the afterlife. And then the same way, now, when it, somebody said about like being more aware and alert, the vigilance connects to, uh, or like can connect to the part where it says, be vigilant about death or be aware, be alert of this. Yeah, amazing. Great. Yeah. Um, for, for a lot of our experiences with death, it has to do with sadness and, and suffering. So if, if you think about the hereafter first, it makes death less scary. It's just um, it's just a, it's just a stop on the journey towards the hereafter. Yeah, also helps to reconcile that the person you love that you lost is not gone. They've just moved on in terms of the way all of us are going to move on one day, right? Do you know? But if you think about death alone. Right, this is where this religion, nothing nafsi is a key to Jannah, right? There's nothing egocentric. I'm not at the center and everything revolves around me, right? God is at the center. Allah is at the center. And we all exist in a sphere of interaction, of interdependence, right? So somebody passes away that I love deeply and I have no understanding of like what, what's going on versus I've already understood the reality of a hereafter. It doesn't mean that death is not difficult when a loved one dies. The Prophet ﷺ shed tears at the passing of his loved ones. Like, it's just there quite evidently, do you know? But understanding where there's still room for what lies ahead in terms of what exists forever like, these are people who just moved on and transitioned, right? This is what death is in our deen. If you meet a lot of Muslims, for example, who are from the community of Imam Warth Deen Muhammad, rahimullah, right? Imam Warth Deen Muhammad, who is, who is Imam Warth Deen Muhammad? Do people know? Yeah, who is he? No. Yeah, close, but no, he's not. Yeah. Yeah, so he's the son of Elijah Muhammad, and he moved towards embracing a more Sunni orthodoxy, and like tons of people converted to Sunnism. Um, and not to get into too much of the detail of the history of that, but quite often when you talk to black Muslims who are part of the community of Imam Warthi Muhammad, they don't even say someone died, they just say they transitioned, you know? And they're just very aware of it and conscious in relation to belief. Do you get what I mean? What other reasons why might there be benefit in reflecting on the hereafter before reflecting on death? Yeah, go ahead. Well, reflecting on the hereafter kind of gives you glad tidings of, of the promise of eternity. And then reflecting on death kind of instills a fear in you on why you should stay away from sin and do what you're allowed to do and to be there. Yeah. And think about New York City, right? We all are in New York City right now, right? Some of you might live outside of the city. You're here, it's a transient city. Some of you might live in New Jersey or Connecticut. You, likely most of us, live in one of the boroughs of New York, right? Do you ever walk through most of Manhattan, at least, and see billboards that are filled with, like, the elderly? You know, where you're in a place that you live in a world that is afraid of its own mortality. It purposely pushes its elders into homes quite separate, 
right? And it's not to not, just think about it objectively. Some of you grew up in homes where your grandparents were a part of your home life. They were just there. Some of you lived in cities growing up where entire kind of like communal-based living, right? Families, neighbors, friends. We live in a city now, especially in Manhattan. You can live 10 years next to the person in the apartment next to you. You don't even know their name, right? But in terms of this idea of mortality, a big selling point in a consumer-driven society to just spend in pursuit of what we're selling you that will give you immediate satisfaction necessitates having so much that is rooted in what is quote-unquote youthful because it keeps you from them planning like for when you are elder, right? Do you ever see a commercial where people are eating at like a Papa John's or drinking something or buying some clothes and it's all like 85 year old men and women? No, right? They're not telling you that happiness is when you're old. They're saying happiness is right now. And then they're making you hate the idea of getting older so that you buy all kinds of things. I'm not saying it's a good or bad. I'm saying it's a reality. So that you're continuously trying to pursue the worship of a physical self that is built to just get frail and fragile and old as opposed to recognizing the part of you that exists eternally. That the body just stays from the dust that it was made from and what is celestial is what moves on, what is inward. And you live in a world that teaches you to spend most of your wakeful time looking at yourself rather than for yourself. And what death allows for is to create a perspective now on, well, what does all of this really mean? And am I using my time as best as I can? But the world around you is afraid of its mortality. And it gets you to be fearful, not of death for the reasons that Islam says, be mindful as a spiritual reflection point on what the reality of death is in relation to a hereafter that is forever. And this is just a means to something, but it tells you to be scared to die because it wants you to believe that you're supposed to just be young forever. The relativeness of time in our tradition from the standpoint of dunya versus akhira, two totally different realities. It's going to feel like a drop in the bucket, this world, regardless of how many years. I'm 40 years old. I don't know how many of you are older than I am, but I know the life that I've lived has also pushed my body to exist in such a way that is well beyond what somebody of my age should be experiencing, given what I've put it through. But understanding the realities of some of these things, even for me, if I live to be twice the age that I am right now, it's going to still all feel like a drop in the bucket in relation to what's going to come after this. Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, he has a letter that he writes that's called the Shahr al-Sadr, the expansion of the chest. The Sadr is the outer layer of the heart, right? The next layer is the Qalb, the layer after that is the fu'ad. The layer after that is the lub. The sadr is where shaitan knocks, right? He's knocking at the outer layer. You decide if you let him in through your own vulnerabilities and anxieties. And again, it's not conjecture. This is Quran. This is how it functions. You can either buy into it or not buy into it. I would say you should buy into it. So that reflection and contemplation can allow for you to have a heart that's vigilant and stand guard over these things. Imam Ghazali, he writes this letter, the expansion of the chest, the way Musa salam makes dua, Rabbi shrah li sadri, right? The Quran says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak, right? Did we not expand for you your chest? So this is this letter that he writes, it's just a reflection on death. The entire letter is a remembrance of death as a mechanism to help one understand how they can value their life more. 
A lot of you saw the images from when I went to Turkey right after the earthquake. Do people remember? Who was at Juma that day? Where instead of starting with the khutbah, I did some videos and photographs, right? It was crazy, wasn't it? There were just devastation and everything. May Allah make it easy for them. And walking through this place, seeing like the number of people impacted, or in any like conflict zone, refugee camp, whatever it might be, when I was in Turkey and I asked people there, like, what would you like me to tell people? Consistently, one of the things that I was told by these people who lived through an earthquake and witnessed many of their loved ones die in this earthquake and lost their homes in an earthquake, are living outside in a tent because of an earthquake, have developed PTSD because of an earthquake, were already refugees who are Uyghur or Palestinian or a large amount of them Syrian and now living again through difficult tragedy, this earthquake. Most of these people consistently said, whenever you tell people about our story, make sure you tell them to not waste time. That none of us woke up that day thinking that this is what the day would bring upon us. And so don't waste time fighting unnecessarily with people. Don't waste time gossiping and lying and backbiting. Don't waste time because you don't know when something's going to happen. None of us woke up thinking that we were going to get hit by an earthquake today. Do you understand? How is it relevant to what we're talking about? Real Iman in this religion? Sound belief has to incorporate that I don't know if today is my last day or not. If you think you are going to live till next week, that's not what Islam teaches, Yarhamukullah. That's just fundamentally it. Does that make sense? And now, if you become subservient, not to the God who created death, right? He says it in the Quran. It's in Surah Al-Mulk. He's the one that created death and life. If you become rather submissive to that God, instead you become submissive to a society that's built upon anti-blackness, supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy. In the most terrible forms of any of these things, inclusive of things that can't exist other than in ugly forms, then you're going to be afraid to be able to embrace the reality that can be a source of empowerment and strength that today might be the day I breathe my last breath. So why would I spend it doing some of the stupidity that I do, the futility that I seek? Why would I let this be the day that potentially I leave the world not having fulfilled the rights that people have over me, the responsibilities that I have? Why would I not pursue things that bring real light to my heart Spend time with the ones that I love. Be in a place where I'm engaging in things. I spend a lot of time with people who are in their last moments in this world. Is anybody here a doctor, a nurse, a practitioner of something that brings you into interaction with people towards the end of their life? Does anybody do any of that professionally? You do? What do you do? Okay, so you see a lot of people towards the end of their life. And how about yourself in the back? Okay, great. So the two of you, tell me if I'm wrong, right? I have never met somebody who is about to leave from the world 
that has said to me, it's not a joke, it's a reality. I've never met somebody who's about to leave from the world and says, I wish I had five more minutes to post something online. I wish I had another day to binge watch that show. I'm not saying that those aren't things, but if you incorporate them as a self-care strategy rather than mindless wastes of time, intention is different. I've never met somebody who says, I wish I had five more minutes where I could just go and be mean to someone. Where I could go look down upon someone. Where I could tell another lie. Where I could gossip with somebody, backbite someone. Have you ever met somebody who's about to die and they say something like that to you? No, right? You're probably meeting people who say, I wish I hadn't like, chased after the things I chased after or spent so much time pursuing what I did. I wish I could go back and seek forgiveness from the people that I wronged. I wish I expressed myself a little bit more effectively in terms of the emotions I carry with myself. Do you get what I mean? The reflection on the reality that is death. Again and again, understanding. It doesn't mean that you stop to exist. You have to know what death is in Islam as a religion. Death does not mean that there's nothing that comes after. Death is the mechanism that takes you from this world into the next worldly existence, which for us is the barzakh, the intermediary realm, the grave. May Allah make all of our graves places of lights and from the gardens of the gardens of His paradise. But understanding it, again, in the prism of what Imam al-Haddad is saying, that if you reflect upon this reality that is death, the benefit of this kind of reflection is that hopes become short, behavior better, and provision is gathered for the appointed day. Meaning, all I'm trying to do, man, is get done what I can, so when I stand in front of Allah, there's going to be the only thing I bring, which is my amal, my acts, my deeds. This world, if you want to give it a label, this is a world of decision making. This is a world of action. People ask me, a friend of mine texted me the other day that I went to college with, and he was upset with me, because I don't know how many of you are in my phone book, but I send WhatsApp messages like crazy to people, telling them donate to this and come to this and that, right? I don't feel bad about it. And so I sent something <laughs> out and he sent me a message and he said, this is the one year anniversary of this text I sent you last year that you never responded to. And I was like, man, don't hold a grudge against me. And you know, he was joking around and stuff. And he said, why don't you stop like sometimes and just enjoy life, right? And he's like, why don't you take a break? And I love him, he's my brother. We went to school together, our kids hang out with each other. And I said very genuinely to him, not preachy, because he's my friend. And he said, why don't you just rest? I said, this isn't the world for rest. I'm gonna rest in the next world. This is where you get things done. Every day you're accomplishing things, you just have to decide, are those the things that you actually want to be accomplishing? Do you want to accomplish hurt in someone's life? Do you want to accomplish pain in someone's life? Do you want to accomplish healing? Because you have a messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who the Quran says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We did not send you except to be a mercy to the world, right? To be a mercy, meaning it's an active engagement of mercy. You're doing mercy. You're doing compassion. How can you do that if you don't do, do it, literally? Do you see? If the only thing I accomplished was a big pile of what? And that's where the reflection comes in and death is a mechanism. What am I using this time for? Why did Allah give me these breaths to begin with? And what becomes futile, right? Lahu is futility. There's no benefit or detriment to it. Most of us are not engaging in actions that are just terrible. You're not going to leave from here and go and rob a taxi driver, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, right? You're not doing that. 
What most of us do is just pursue futility. And that's where the reality of the hereafter and the reflective point before this is important. If you follow the preoccupations of the dunya, then they're going to preoccupy you. They're going to create then anxiety in an unhealthy way. They're going to create worry in an unhealthy way. And they're going to keep you from being able to be the full source of blessing that you can be for people who are going through real difficulty and challenge in their life. And this is why I asked you 30 minutes ago, how do you know what you believe in? You got to sit down and just think about it. What do I actually believe in? Not in ways that weaponize beautiful, robust theology in our religion. You buy into what this religion teaches you about what you should really hold as a conviction, you're going to see the world totally different. And what you bring to your actions will be different. But this reflection on death is an imperative in being able to have a healthiness in terms of the inward state. Why am I letting somebody else raise my child? Why would I let somebody else teach my kid how to pray? In the pandemic, New York City lost 30,000 people, subhanAllah, right in the first however many weeks. I don't know how many of you were here. This is the building I live in. There are multiple hospitals that surround this place. We heard sirens all the time, all day and all night, all day and all night. This community, the Islamic Center community, in the first few weeks, we had 100 people pass away before we stopped counting. And all of that can be really heavy to experience if there's not something to put it into perspective. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتِ Allah says, right? تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ It's a surah that talks about doing glorification of the creator of these things. The one who created death. Allah is the one that made death in His infinite wisdom. Why did He give it to you? And how do you shift the paradigm that has you see it different from the rest of creation so that it's a source of upliftment, not something that makes you walk with trepidation, and that you wake up every day. And what I learned from COVID was, I don't want somebody else being the father to my children. I don't want somebody else being my wife's husband. I don't want somebody else being my parent's child. I don't want somebody else being any of these things that is my blessing to be. When the Prophet Sallallahu <coughs> says, Kullu shayin laysa min dhikrillah that all of those things that do not have the remembrance of God to them, they are futile. Atta ibn Abi Rabah, who is from the generation of the Tabi'een, he sees two companions discussing this thing of lagu, and they say four things that are not lagu. Four things that are not waste of time. One, they say running between two lines, exercising. Two, taking care of your steed, meaning you care for the things that are in your possession. Three, swimming, they say. Again, physical wellness. And four, spending time with one's family. That means when I go home, if my elderly mother is sitting and watching something, in her own cultural language late at night, and I'm sitting with my mother purely for the intention of being with my mother, then there's barakah in that for me. It's not a waste of time. I could go and sit with my mom and preach all kinds of things that people, when they're zealous, might think that's what religion is, but it's not. Allah made it simple. You just got to sit with them and let them know that you value their presence in your life. That everything is not meant to be turned into why I know this deen better than you. Do you see what I mean? And you reflect on death in different ways that say, hey, their time is coming also, subhanAllah. Does it make sense? So between this week and next week, these additional two reflection points, five minutes in your day, Reflect on the reality of the Akhirah. 
This is what Imam al-Haddad is saying. Reflect on the reality of the world that comes after this one. Reflect on it in terms of how this world is proportional to that. And reflect on death. We hope you enjoyed our podcast. If you're inspired by the work that we're doing at the IC and want to help keep it going, subscribe to our podcasts, follow us on social media, donate to help support us at icnyu.org, and most importantly, keep us in your continued du'as. Until next time, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.